Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. Uh, this is Austin Linney here. I got a, my special guest, uh, Darren. He's got his shoe collection in the background. You're going to hear about all that great stuff, man. Uh, we got connected through Leland, who uh, seems to know everybody. So I'm really excited to have you on. How you doing, my man? I'm doing pretty good. So we talked briefly on the phone. Uh, this guy's got a lot of different stuff going on, a lot of fun stuff. I'm really excited about this because... This is, you know, hustle. This is entrepreneurship. This is figuring it out as you go along. So did you tell me that you tried to buy a house at like 17 or 18? Is that what you said to me? So, okay. So, yeah. I was, yeah, start me out with that story. It started out with, you know, middle school, high school, like just the mindset of family and taking care of my family and what am I going to do to provide. And my dad always used to make jokes because I have a little sister and he always tell like her, like the, the boyfriend, don't let him just come in your life and just be trying to take everything. Like he need to provide something too. And then he told me like, if I'm going to be that boyfriend, if I'm going to be that husband, I need to provide. And it's got to be equal or I at least need to bring something to the table. So my whole life, I always thought that. So coming out of high school, I'm already like, I need to get a house. I need to do this. Because my dad did the same thing when he got, a, when he, uh, got out of high school. So I was thinking like I was behind, like I need to buy a house at 18 because uh, he got his at 20 and I was like, okay, I got to get there. So I was ready to purchase a home. I had enough cash to at least do a deal. And uh, by the time I got 21 and it just fell through because I didn't, I didn't know much about, I finally had started understanding about credit at that time, but I didn't know much about like leveraging things and like getting loans and all that stuff. So I'm like, Oh yeah, I'll just buy a house. Like you know, I got some cash. Like well, I'll, I'll try to get the deal to happen, and it didn't really work out how I wanted it to. Couldn't get the final document signed, and I was just all sad and mad about it because I was just so <laughs> hopeful. Dude, I, I like, love it because you're just like, dude. I don't really. It's so funny that you say this because I just did a podcast with a with a real estate investor who has like 150 houses, mm -hmm. and my theory is that when you're young, the reason that you move so quickly is because you don't know any better, right? right? Right. And when you're older, you have context and you're like, well, I don't know if I should do that. And like, I love, <laughs> you know, like, I love how, like, I got all these young hustlers in my life that have like 180 units right. and they don't know any better. Right. Cause right. they're just buying and moving forward. Right. So yeah. that's one part of the story, but let's talk about what is your, you do the real estate and we'll get into that. But I want to talk mm -hmm. about your main business, which did you learn this from Gary V or did you just kind of figure it out? <laughs> when you were rolling, man, because he's the king of this. So, um, okay, so I'm 29 now, and I started mm -hmm. when I was like 16. Okay, uh, but for me, honestly, it started even farther back. Like, uh, I don't know if you see my Pokemon cards on the ground because I just pulled those out because I, I was see like, him. bro, yeah. this is crazy. Like, I can't believe these things are going for so dude, much, dude. No, so, I gotta laugh. I gotta laugh because I was with a bunch of roofers in Dallas visiting them. They had this uh -huh. huge company. Dude, he bought a Luca, uh, the Luca card, the rookie card uh -huh, uh -huh. for like three. He just sold it for ten. Oh my gosh! So talk to me about <laughs> this. I'm pumped, dude. This is like in my wheelhouse right now. So okay, so another random interesting thing about me: my parents put me in the Japanese immersion program. So when I was in kindergarten through high school, I learned Japanese half day, English the other half of the day. I go to Japan, I do research studies, and then I. Uh, um, come back with information. We do presentations and that's like our final project for like fifth grade and eighth grade. And then we go to high school and then it's kind of like, uh, we only do one class out of the seven throughout the day, like type thing. But it was, uh, obviously a huge Japanese culture, a part of my life, even though I was like living in the hood of Portland and like mixed coming from two different sides of the world, black and white, but then like learning Japanese, playing in all the like local, you know, urban now quoted, <laughs> Uh, you know, football, basketball, baseball, track, you name it, top athlete at all these things. And then I'm like over at this other school, like a standout kid that doesn't really fit in because pretty much everybody else at my school is white. And it's just like, I, it just didn't, 
really mesh well for me like my entire life but I made great friendships with those people that were in my class at the same time so during all that uh I was always trading Pokemon cards with my homies because we would go to Japan or like you know this is like when I'm in middle grade school at this time is the early in the 90s early 2000s and we're like trading all these cards and I'm like hustling and now my goal is like how can I get the most cards I want to have the best collection out of everybody in my school and like all those things and then uh I started like hustling like random things. I started selling t-shirts to all my homies. And then I was like selling donuts out of my locker during middle school and stuff. So it was like literally started from a long time ago. I was cutting grass, riding my bike, like all around the neighborhood. My parents always held me accountable. Like if I broke something, third grade, seventh grade, whatever grade I was in, I had to pay it off. I had to fix it and I had to make right for what I had done. So we had a black party one time. And I broke a mirror in front of everybody on the car because we were playing football in the street. And I threw the ball super far because I used to play quarterback. And I threw the ball far and the dude missed it and it went right past his hands and it just hit the mirror and shattered and everybody just stopped. And they're like, and I was like, damn, I got to pay for that. So I went up to the lady. I was like, how much does it cost? My parents like, all right, this is what it is. This is what you got to do to work it off. And I just had always known, like, I got to make money because I was just always thinking that from a young age. And then by the time I got to high school, My parents were like, we're not buying you no more shoes. You're not getting nothing you want. And you got to figure it out. So now I'm like, I want all these sneakers. Like, I love shoes. I've been laced up in shoes my whole life. Living in Portland, Nike, Adidas, everything. The headquarters is here. So I was like, what am I going to do? So, again, hustling, you know, cutting grass, all that stuff. Freshman year, still playing football, still playing sports. And then I got to uh, sophomore year where I was able to, you know, work an actual job. So I worked at the family restaurant. And uh, that's where I started making all my money. I had my little checks coming in, you know, working part time, coming after school or like heavy in the summertime and then still training. And uh, I would just buy a bunch of shoes. Had all these shoes in my collection. Like first year I started, I purchased over 100 pairs of shoes just for my own collection. People seeing like, yo, you got all these shoes. Like, what's up? I'm trying to buy some. And I'm like, nah, man, you know, I'm just a collector, man. I just like these things. And then that's when it stuck. I'm like, I think I can make some money off of this. Like everybody keeps asking me, maybe I could just charge them for like, I'm already at the store. I might as well just buy another pair and then just charge them. And then I can make my pair cheaper. So I started doing that. And I was like giving people good deals. And everybody was like, bro, he got the best deals. And I didn't realize like I had the best deals because I didn't really know it was like a business or anything. Like it could be something. This is like in 2007. So this is before the hype of reselling sneakers and the whole thing. Because you got to remember, like, it started popping off more in, like, 2014, 2015, mm-hmm. where everybody's like, oh, wow, look at these young sneaker entrepreneurs and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. So I've seen all that happening, and I'm like, I got to take advantage of this. So I was like, I'm going to start a Facebook group when I get out of high school, when I get to college. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start a Facebook group and build a community and, you know, just sell them my shoes and then, like, curate. And make sure other people don't get scammed and make sure everybody's good. And I did that. And I said, every time I get a thousand followers on Facebook, I'm going to give away a free pair of shoes. Because I love making sure, like, I always want to be the one that has a story with somebody's life through shoes. So if I'm the one that gave you, like, your first pair of Jordan 1s or whatever, it's dope to me. Because, like, you're going to never forget that. You're going to tell that story. And it's just like... I don't know. I just love shoes. So I feel like that's a dope story for me to be able to give that to somebody else because I'm so passionate about it and they have an interest in it. So I I built the business uh, 2011. I graduated high school 2010. So I did really well on Facebook. And then that's when I built my business uh, online. And I just basically had an online sneaker consignment shop in 2011 where it was like official, no more like side hustle, like selling and everything. And uh, that was like midway through the year. And I was telling my parents, I was like, I can make a lot of money doing this. I know I can do this. I'm going to college. I'm playing football. I'm trying to go to the NFL. I'm trying to graduate. I'm trying to do all these things. And uh, still running a business at the same time, living on the East Coast by myself. And it just ended up working out. Like I showed them. I was like, look, I can do this. I made like 130000 within like eight months of my first year just selling shoes. And they were like, like, oh, this is real. Like, you could actually do this. And I'm like, I'm telling you, like, this is possible. If I have more time, like, I could make this even bigger. 
So then I was like, I'm going to get a store. Like, I'm going to open up a shop. I'm going to have everything when I come back. It's going to be super dope. And then still trying to graduate, trying to do all that stuff. I transferred. I went to seven. I think it was a total of – I had a transcript from, I think, six or seven different colleges from the time I graduated high school to 2017. I went why were you, Why were you transferring so much? So – I got out of high school with football. I got out of high school and I didn't have anywhere to go, but I knew I was a good athlete. I just didn't have the scouting that I needed to get a scholarship. And the whole goal was to get a scholarship so I could have school for free because I don't want to have that burden on myself or my parents. So I went to a prep school because I had got a call like super last minute. I went to this camp like right after my senior year of high school and I was like the top player. And then I got sent to another camp to be the top, all the top players come together. So it was like, all these top kids in the nation are like playing SEC football and everything. And I went to that camp and I was like killing. I was like doing better than all of them. Everybody's like, who's this kid? What school is he going to? All this stuff. I'm like, I don't got no school. Like nobody wants me. I'm just having fun. Like I just figured it'd be a cool last ride thing. And like, no, nah, you got to go somewhere. So that's when I heard about prep school. And I went to prep school 2010. And they're like, if you go here, you can play football. It's like a super grad senior thing or something like that. And basically, you can just use your film, and then we'll get you out to a college for a scholarship. So I was like, all right, cool. Tried that, balled out, broke all the records at the school. And then they were like, cool, you can uh, go here, here, here. And I just went to the very first school that offered me. I didn't care what level it was. It was a nice D2 school. I was like, these are the ones that want me. Like, whoever's the first person interested in me, at the time, I was thinking it was the best move. Just because I was like, nobody wanted me before. So if you want me now, like, I want the first person that wants me. Mm-hmm. so I went to the school it was great it was cool like my coach my position coach great coach one of the best coaches I've ever had but my head coach it just was the worst <laughs> mm-hmm. he had me running circles around the field one day at practice because the quarterback threw a bad ball and it bounced and it hit me like it bounced the ground and then it shot it like land in my hands he didn't see it because he was turning around and then he was like catch the ball and I'm like I can't catch the ball because it was like, it came too short. Like I couldn't do nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was like, it was a bad ball coach. And he was like, it was what? And then next thing you know, he was like, hit the laps. And this is like the first thing we do for warmups. He had me running the entire practice and I had my little watch thing on. I ran almost 12 miles during this (sighs) practice. Like get water. I'm like, I ain't getting no water. Like I was dumping out all the water every time they gave it to me. I ran for two hours. I didn't care. And then, then he apologized after, after my legs was dead. But, that's just one part of me not liking it there. Yeah. Transferred, and I got in a car accident at the next school, and then the truck rolled over like seven times. My homie flew out the sunroof. I was like a vegetable. My parents flew out to California where I was going to school next. And uh, it just – it was like a series of unfortunate events. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I went to the next school. That's when I went to the JUCO out in California, and I was balling out out there, and I had uh, – just so many schools like Cincinnati, Hawaii, you name it, like D1 schools, BYU, Oregon State, all these schools that's like, yo, they're literally out here watching me practice and everybody's like around, like scouting me, doing all this stuff. And I'm like calling my parents like, this is my time. This is my moment. Like I'm about to do what I said I was going to do. Like mm-hmm. I know I can play on TV. And then that's when I got hurt in a car accident and then my eligibility got messed up. So then I'm just like fighting the clock with athletics, still trying to run a business, doing all these things. It's just like so much happening from 2010 to 2017. It was crazy. While I'm still running my business, still doing all these things. And I couldn't even write a sentence or even like I had short term memory loss. I had to go to therapy just to function again. Like there was a probably like an eight month period in 2013 after the car accident where they were like, yeah, he'll never play football again. He'll probably need to be helped. He'll need to be – he'll probably need help. He'll probably need to, like, have assistance driving, like, all these different things. And I'm like, nah, I'm about to get through all that. Like, I need to play football again. Like, I love this. I want to play. And then it took me, like, a year and a half, and I was able to come back and play football and get cleared. And through all that – adversity and the changing and the coaches that didn't support you. And then now we have the wreck, right? Right. Why, do you think it was your upbringing or why are you, you, you just sound like such a positive person. I would imagine like I've had a lot of rock bottoms in my life. I would imagine 
there's some doubt that creeps in or you just don't have that in your DNA? Um, I think that I got so many strong people in my corner from grandparents, great grandparents, great, great grandparents that I've seen in my life. Like there was a time, especially on my dad's side, like I seen four different, I had my great grandma, my great, great grandma, my grandma, my dad, like all these generations ahead of me. And I seen the strength in like all my family and all the stuff that they had been through, even both sides of my family. And it's just like, they kept a way to always be positive, always be happy and just keep that in my life. So for me, it was like, they always, my dad was like, be better than me, do everything better than me. Like his dad was never there. So he always brought the positivity to me, made me feel confident, made me feel strong. And because of that, I feel like it's so easy for me to just not be like cocky or whatever people want to call it. But I'm just so confident in myself that I'm like, I know I can get through this because I've been drilled this my whole life. Like whatever happens, you can get through it. If you want to get through it, you can make it happen. So I feel like it's just little things from literally a great little little kid to now still to this day. I got to try all the trials and tribulations, but I still got to either way. It's going to go up or down. So I really go up. <laughs> yeah, no. And it's funny that you say that because I had one of my coaching clients ask me today, like, dude, you, you had a meth addiction. You were homeless. Mm-hmm. You, you were an alcoholic for 20 years. Like, what was the like, what is the term? Like, how do you stay positive? How do you like, you know, all that mm-hmm. shit. And I, I think that like, there's a, there's a part of gratitude. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, like, like I, I figured this out about people and I think you're, you're a shining example of this. Like in life, all we want as a person is opportunity. Right. Like give us like, you know, that's why Hail Mary passes are so great in football. Right. Cause right. they're just like, dude, that's the one shot, man. Right. And like <laughs> everybody loves the comeback story. And like there are people that you can screw up for 30 years, but you could switch it around and, and people are going to be more drawn to that. Mm-hmm. Like the struggles, the, and, but what you have to do to get through it is you, is you said it, you have to be surrounded by the right people. You have to mm-hmm. generate the right mindset. And no matter what life throws at you, if you have the right, screws up top and you can keep the right attitude you can keep pushing forward because it's not you know you wanted to buy that house and you wanted to play on tv you know and so I, this is a great transition here because your dream was to be on tv obviously mm-hmm. and play football mm-hmm. but you're on a different kind of tv now you know right. one of that one of the youtube channels so talk about like kind of how that business grows and all your entrepreneurship and, and everything. Cause I think it's just, this is an amazing story. So one thing that was crazy was I, I, uh, I don't know. I guess this all ties together cause it's just all me, but senior year of college, um, prepping for the NFL. I'm, I'm like, I know I can do this. I can come out from wherever I'm at. I know it. Like I can compete. Like I got so many friends that are in the NFL, all these different things. And I blew out my ankle and it was completely blown out my entire junior year. And my coaching staff didn't tell me because they wanted me to keep playing because I was performing so well going into my senior year. I had to have surgery immediately as soon as I walked into my doctor to get it checked. So (laughs) it ruined my entire summer before my senior year of college football. And I still came back. Then they never played me. And I was Mm. the best player. I was the best receiver doing my thing. And they, they put a bunch of freshmen in and they just made me like a player coach. And I was out there performing at practice every single day, like on my on point doing all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm still going to try no matter what. So I went to the NFL combine and I did, I went to the regional combine and uh, I was up in Seattle, all these players. And I got other players complimenting me. I got other coaches like talking to me. I'm like, I think I could still make it. I could be like an undrafted guy. Like, I think I could do this. I was performing really well. And um, during that same exact time, on my ride up there, I was just closing on my first ho- my first house. I had college graduation coming up uh, a week and a half or something like that after that. And then I was trying out for the NFL. So within like a 30-day period, I had bought a house, graduated, co- graduated college, and was trying out for the NFL. And it was like... To me, I was telling people about that, and they're like, yo, that's so much. Like, I could only do one of those things. And I'm like, I started thinking, I was like, 
I've been doing this for seven years trying to do all this. And it's just like all coming together at the same exact time, which is weird. But it was just showing me like, I can make this happen. Like, I know I can do whatever I want to do. And I was talking to my friend and he was like, after I told him I wanted to do a YouTube channel and just talk about my experiences of selling sneakers and all the things I've done, the private parties and the exclusive events and the athletes that I've worked with and, you know, All-Star Weekend, you name it, all these different things. And uh, he was like, yeah, this is the one thing that you have control of. Your coaches always had control of you. They, they're the ones that wouldn't let you play. You put all this effort in every single day and somebody else could control that. If you make a YouTube channel, well, when I had already made it, he's like, you have control of this channel. You can do whatever you want to do. You don't have to look up to nobody. You don't have to ask no questions. It's all in your control. And then when he said that, <laughs> I started thinking like, you're right. Like, I don't, I don't need no coaches. I don't need no approval. I can do whatever I want. Like, learn how I want, post how I want, do whatever I want to do. So I started really diving deeper into that and trying to control, like, what do I want to do? How can I monetize more? How can I do this better? What events do I need to go to? Who do I need to meet? Uh, you know, stay consistent. That's not a problem for me because I already love it and I don't need somebody to be like, oh, yeah, don't forget to post a video or don't forget to do this. Like, I already want to do it. So I don't have to worry about the motivation part. Like, I was just like the strategy now. So that I just built a channel, which is called The DNA Show. And basically on my channel, I talk about how I can teach my 16 year old self or anybody, but I want to teach them about sneakers and all the things that I could translate to them from the things I've learned over the past, however many years has been 13, 14 years. And basically I just create content that's hopefully super educational. A lot of people do get value from it. And I talk about all different things, what shoes to buy, how to sell them, you know, how to protect your shoes and it may seem stupid to a lot of people and it may be super value to others. And for me, I'm like, whoever it's valuable to, that's who I'm talking to. I don't care about who it's not valuable to because clearly they're not here for this. So I want to talk to the people that's here for this and the people that care about this. And then if you do, what's up? You're a part of the DNA fam now. Like, let's get it. What you got? You got questions? I got answers. And I want to hit a couple of things there. And if I don't ask, people will DM me and I'll have to answer 30 questions. What happened Man. at the Combine? The Combine. Did you get in Which, the NFL or no? No. Okay. So they, I had my agent had talked to the Buccaneers and I was thinking like, oh, yeah, this is going to be good. Like they had they started writing articles about me and everything. I'm like, oh, sleeper pick, all these different things. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like I really might have a chance. I got family and friends like messaging me and I got all these little articles about me and stuff. And I'm like, this is going to be my, you know what I'm saying? This is going to work. And then literally nothing happened. They were like, yeah, we'll talk to you. We want, you know, we're interested and then never got a call. So I was just ready for like camp or something, try to give my shot. Like you said, just give me my one shot. Nothing ended up happening. So then I went to a CFL combine and uh, for the BC Lions, I went there balling out, routing everybody, catching all my stuff, like doing really well. And then, they were the same thing, super interested. And then I checked their roster and they ended up drafting or they ended up trading for a veteran receiver from a different team. So they're like, yeah, we don't need any receivers anymore right now. So that's when I was just like, I'm dead. I can't do this no more. Because it's just so much. Like, well, mind, what, body, I, what soul, I would imagine, and I want to I wanna ask, because that's disappointment. Like you played this your whole life and you had right. dreams. Right. How how do you deal with that disappointment? Because that is disappointment. You do have right. a business over here, but there's real disappointment there. So for how sure. do you deal with that? Uh, for me, I just kept working out. I kept training. And what I did was, like, that next summer, during that time, I I got, like, a group of people together. And I just brought the – just I always wanted to have the energy. Because for me, I've, I've never – besides working at my family's restaurant – I've never had a nine to five. I've always controlled my life. I've always made my own money. I wake up when I want to wake up. I do what I want to do. And I make sure that I'm available for my family and friends when they need me. That's what my life is about. So for me, it was the same thing with that. I kept training, but it was just kind of for myself to now become like a fit dad. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just need to be an athletic dad. That was just, that's what I always yep. tell people. So, but I did it by, 
just bring your family and friends together and being like, hey, let's come out to the field. Let's all work out together. Like, I'll put a full workout plan for us. Let's, like, have some fun. Let's play some music. Like, we'll do some ladder drills. And we'll have you guys. I had the girls out there catching footballs. And, you know, we was just all having fun. And we was doing it every single day, like, in the summertime or, like, a few times a week. And that's where I was just loving it. Like, football feels like my sanctuary. You know, I just have so much fun. There was nothing better than being out there with one of my best friends from – my four, my fifth grade football team we're out there still playing football together you know just stuff like that so for me it was just again going back to my people and being around my squad and just having a good time doing the thing I still love and not just letting it take over me and being sad and stop working out and coming up with excuses and everything like that this is something I think will resonate with you and I just did a podcast about this this week and it's my new soapbox I'm I'm on it big time and I think you probably see it in and your business and the guys that YouTube with you. Mm-hmm. I think as adults uh, in the society that we're in, we have removed the fun from life. Right. I think everybody's trying to get to a goal, a, a, a financial ladder moment and everything. Right. And we forgot like what you said right there. You brought it back to like, I got to play with my dude from fifth grade and like, I just kept it light and there was music going on. And somehow we've stripped the fun out of the journey. Right. Mm-hmm. And because we're trying to, get, well, I'll be there when I get there. And there's something almost great. And I'm sure like you love every single 800,000 fan that you have right now on YouTube as a subscriber. Mm-hmm. But I would imagine there was something really fun when you had like 10. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. like, yeah. that's why I, I was just telling my friend that the other day. I'm like, bro, I remember when I used to be refreshing my phone, just waiting for one new subscriber. Like, <laughs> where they at like just the 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 grind the struggle like this is crazy like yeah yeah, I definitely remember that and I'll never like take that for granted because I'll always appreciate it because you know one of my favorite lines is uh be married to the process and divorce from the results Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. the the results are never what you think they're going to be I mean you thought you're going to be a football star right right Right. and and I would imagine and we'll get into it at the back half of the call to talk about real estate which I'm sure is a whole nother journey (laughs) <laughs> but let's talk let's talk about the YouTube stuff and let's talk uh-huh. about you didn't know what you were doing in the beginning. You made one, you know, 130,000. You're kind of just figuring it out. You don't know websites, right. you don't know any of that stuff. But as this goes on, I would imagine that you as an entrepreneur, you know, you surrounded yourself with people maybe that mm-hmm. knew or you figured it out yourself. What You know, if you gave advice to that younger version of yourself, like, what would you tell him? What would you tell him, like, when he was getting started to where you are right now? The biggest thing is you got to be patient. You have to be patient. Like, you can have all the goals and dreams that you want. But like you're saying, it's a part of trust in the process is being patient. Because if you try to rush something or cut corners, you're not going to do it right. You could get injured if you don't, you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to do this. And then I got injured. Now I, I got set back farther. If I just did the thing I did, take all the reps I need to take, warm up how I'm supposed to warm up, do what I need to do. If you be patient and go through the process, and if you think that's right, at that moment, that's all you know, then do the best that you can do with what you know, and then continue to try to learn more. So then that way, a year from now, you're in a better place, and you're still doing the best that you can do with what you know. Because I know way more this year than I did last year, and I know next year, I'm going to learn, learn way more. So do the best I can with what I know now and then try to learn more. So next year I can do the best I can with what I know then. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in the flipping the sneakers business and you don't have to share your numbers, but has it exponentially grown every year? Is it to a place where you feel comfortable with where it's at or it's, it's still expanding. So I've actually started to try to, I'm trying to remove myself from it actually, because Obviously, there's way more money in the real estate, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, for example, a bunch of shoes in my sneaker collection. I have over 700 pairs in my collection. And the reason why I did because I knew I was like, when I get out of college, I'm going to sell so many shoes, I'm going to use it to buy a house. So, sold about 400 pairs of shoes, got about 80000 from it. <laughs> and then I was like, cool, I can use this. That's why I bought two houses within, like, a month and a half. The first house I had bought then, and then I had bought the second house right after. And... As you know, you don't need all the money to purchase a home. You just need some down payment, da, 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 get it working. All right, cool. We found the best deal that works for me. So I'm trying to step away from sneakers. I've done deals for sneakers. I didn't show the shoes for $10,000, $20,000 for one pair of shoes. Yep. And now I'm at the point where I, 
I work with a very unique clientele, high rollers, like, cause I stop, I don't have time. Literally it takes so much energy to mm-hmm. sell a hundred pairs of shoes, a thousand pairs of shoes. Like it just takes too much energy and my time and my life to me is important. So I need to value that and try to find the best way to be as efficient as possible. So I'm like, cool, I'll just sell like very rare, very exclusive sneakers to make what I needed to make instead of doing like this high volume, like looking flashy on the internet, barely making any money thing. Nah, I'll just buy this like one rare shoe, get it for the low and then sell it for five times the value and make $10,000 off the deal. Like that's kind of where I'm at now. And I don't have to put as much effort. And then now I can put more time into building my YouTube, monetizing that, making the same amount or more. And then also doing the real estate stuff and investing into that and getting that more passive income with no effort. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Man, I, I got to have you on to teach a class to these young entrepreneurs because one of the things that drives me crazy is I think people live in absolutes, right? And mm-hmm. meaning that like, I'm only going to sell sneakers for like ever. Right. And I, I right. meet dude, I meet dudes that are 23, 24 could retire in six months. Right. And, I, and I, I think, I think to myself like, bro, you got 60 years. You better figure some stuff out. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right. And what I'm, what I mean by that is like you learned, you were in it, you dove mm-hmm. into it. And you, and then what you said is you said, okay, that's great. But what is the highest dollar productive hour that I could be doing right now that takes right. the most amount of stress that allows me to move over here, which mm-hmm. is a little more passive. So what I'm curious on is where did you get introduced to real estate? Was it your parents or how, how did you learn about it? What, where was that? Where did um, that come in? Again, coming from two different sides of the world, white, black, like Mm -hmm. my dark side just, it was came to the struggle, you know, Mm -hmm. moved here from down South, like living out Pendleton, all different stuff. And then like everybody came over here and it was just tough. Like I said, grew up in the streets of Portland. Like I was in the hood. I I came from the spot where there's still shootouts on my block. Like, unfortunately it's still like that to this day, even though I got nothing but white neighbors and pet goats all walking around and all that weird stuff, but it used to, it's still, yes, it's still kind of like that. So, but my, like my white side of the family, generational wealth, passing it down, grandpa, great grandpa, you know what I'm saying? Like okay. showing me cool, good. what, you know, they got the Wendy's and the KFC and all this yep. stuff, you know what I'm saying? And, and the mini mall and all these things. And I'm like, okay. So I didn't already seen that same thing from literally one years old to now. And I'm like, how can I take the streets, the knowledge from hustling? Mix it with what I know with this, blend it together and make it me. And I don't have to like, yeah, I don't be doing the whole like dressing up and talking proper and doing all that stuff. Like I'm going to talk how I talk. This is me. This is who I am. If you don't like it, oh, well, I'm sure somebody else could give me the money from somewhere else. So I don't be, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and here's the thing where we are in society, meaning, so there's a book. It's one of my favorite books. It's called Expert Secrets. It's the guy that built ClickFunnels. Okay. And what he basically is talking about is you as a person, meaning you on a social platform or you in a business. And, mm-hmm. and he says, if you sell your vulnerability and you sell who you are as a person and you leave it like just like you are, mm-hmm. you will attract who you want to attract and you repel who you want to repel. Right. And with Instagram and Facebook and everything, if you're scamming, if you're lying, you're going to get found out. Yeah. And so... You know, I do stupid videos of me dressing in a wig and a cowboy hat and acting like an idiot, like just for a joke, like because I think it's funny. And, <laughs> and and what I'm saying is like, but but well, what I love about you is like I'm me, but I'm very receptive to the fact that these people over here are just chilling <laughs> right. while their real estate's making them money, and right. I want to do that, right? right? And so it's funny that you say that because I'm going to send this podcast to one of my friends who I help her family and everything. And she came from inner city, Philadelphia and, mm-hmm. and she knows Mel, she knows who she is. And I'm going to send this right after and I want the whole family to watch this interview because it's so inspiring. She says, do you understand the amount of energy and fortitude it takes to break generational poverty? Meaning yeah. like, holy shit, like her and her husband are teachers. They're doing Airbnb. They're doing trading. You know, mm-hmm. she's getting mm-hmm. financial accounts set up for her kids. Like, but she had to explain to me, like, I'm serious. Like mm-hmm. she, and I love everybody. Like I don't give a black, purple, white, gay. I, I could care less. I grew up in the restaurant business. I don't even care. But she's like, Austin, like the, the African-American community doesn't understand debts 
and like they don't understand like credit cards and like stocks. They don't even trust the bank, honestly. They don't trust the bank, and I'm like, right. what? And I'm like, I'll teach them. I'm like, I'm cool with that. Like, I'll teach them. And so it got me thinking, like, what we need. And this, by the way, my friends that are Hispanics and own apartment complexes, the same thing in their community. Mm-hmm. Like, there is a chance for you to step out of being the drywaller, the tile yeah. guy, like yeah. you know, the typical place, and being an owner, right? And right. an owner is how that starts the the shifts, right? Yeah. And and that's what I love is to see the Cause look, here's the truth straight up. I love how people like get mad about money and shit. Like screw that mm-hmm. shit. Like dude, money, money does things. Like I get to go on trips right. and like, I get to hang out with my friends and like, right. you know what I'm saying? But like no, we, as a, we as a society don't talk about money. And more importantly, the number one problem is we don't understand money, how it works. Right. 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 And so you're seeing them and you're saying, well, wait, they own Wendy's and all these things in real estate. So when you bought those first two houses, like, were you just like, what did you do with them? Did you flip them? Did you hold them? What was the, so the game? My, my ultimate goal is buy and hold for everything. Okay. The only way I'm going to sell is if I can, like, bubble up to get something bigger. Just like if I flipped a pair of shoes. Like, oh, I got these exclusive ones. Well, I got this house. Like, all these shoes just went up in value. Well, so did this house. Mm-hmm. Oh, I could trade these shoes for that shoe. Well, I just traded these three houses for apartment complex, and that's going to make more money. It's the same concept. It's just now what house is. It's a bigger game. It's more money. And mm-hmm. I, just like I want to collect shoes, just like I want to collect Pokemons, I'm trying to collect houses. I want mm-hmm. the whole portfolio. I want these types and those types in this city and that city. This is It's the same concept behind it. And that's just kind of where I'm at with it. Right now, I just got the third house. Like mm-hmm. I, I showed you, the, I think I sent mm-hmm. you a picture of someone yeah. who was working mm-hmm. on the back. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I got that about a month and a half ago or something like that. Where we've been making good progress on it. And, uh, again, it's like a flip, but it's not. I'm holding it. So And you have a and you have a property manager that's what managing, or are you managing them yourself? As of right now, it's me doing all this stuff. But that's one great thing about my friends and my crew and uh it's seven of us like that's like real tight all of us as boys from like high school or even younger and uh we play football together in high school and everything and we all come from different but similar backgrounds at the same time and one of my friends is now a property manager he mm-hmm. just got his license and everything and uh, he's ready to roll so i'm gonna be able to pass that all over to him and then obviously bring more business to him at the same time you know, another one of them is an agent and another one does tax appraisals and all mm-hmm. these. So everybody's finding their lane. You know, some of us are the investors and I know how to do all the back end work on the actual construction stuff and everything. So I'm one of the hands on. Can I make a suggestion? I shouldn't tell this on the ear. Maybe I'll save it for a <laughs> You know what? I will make a suggestion because I do whatever. You could steal it, but this is the man with the man. You know what y'all should do? Seriously, all of y'all should get together and create your own fund. Mm-hmm. right that's what you, yep yeah that's you know right yeah. because there is an all there is like there are people right that have mm-hmm. already come before you that came from mm-hmm. where you came that mm-hmm. would die to put money with some hustlers trying to make the you know trying to make better th- better for their family better thing and and i guarantee you you would be turning money away mm-hmm. right but here's the problem when you take money the faucet's got to be whoop you got to turn right. that baby on because they need the right. returns. So right. maybe it's some more like understanding exactly what asset you want to dive right. into. But man, I'm telling you, y'all could really do some damage. Um, and that's that's kind of like you were saying, like we, we're like active and mm-hmm. we're trying to move forward as fast as possible. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we're still like, all right, we're going to make this step. We're going to do it. I don't yeah. know. And then we just like, all right, let's do it. So we still be like over We may overthink some things sometimes or like yeah. try to find better options or something, which may take a little bit longer. So I would say we're definitely moving forward. You know, a few of us have multiple homes and then everybody in the crew for sure has one house. We all got great equity in the homes. We all got good deals mm-hmm. on our homes. So we're, we're almost at that point. You know, it's been two or three years for each and every one of us around the same time buying and everything. So, so, uh, so what I want to offer to you is I've got a, I'm actually speaking to him this afternoon and I'll set up a private call with y'all and your crew, my financial mm-hmm. advisor, who's friends with Mel, he mm-hmm. manages a ton of money and he specializes in teaching investors separate ways to make money 
to do the things that you want to do. So I'll set up that call with you. And then more importantly, I love to talk to the group and see how yeah. I can support y'all in any way and, and speed up sure. the process. But, but I agree, man, my, my mentor says you got to earn the right to take it to the next step. But his favorite line is uh, you got to make your ceiling, your new floor, you know, and you're always pushing and you're yep. always going and, but yep. you're not, but you're not rushing. Right. And yep. then, you know, you might get into a year from now and you might want to move into multifamily, um, small multifamily and stuff. Yeah. Like that. so, that's yeah. where I want to be next yeah. year. I'm trying to get into that, get into that point. And it's funny you said that about the ceiling and the floor. Cause my dad, he always tell me, he's like, you, your ceiling is so high. Like, honestly, you don't have a ceiling. Like mm-hmm. your mind, you can do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And he's like, people will get mad at you because they already hit their ceiling. Yep. And they may be at a certain age. And yep. then now they're like frustrated because they're seeing you doing it or whatever, mm-hmm. because you're the wrong color or the wrong age or, the, or male or female or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, damn, that's crazy because it's really like that. Like, I don't yeah. even be thinking like there's a ceiling at all. Like I'm just no. ready to go. There's a real, like, and, and I want you to, I want you to think about this when you're sitting by yourself. Cause this is my, my buddy's a high performance coach. There's a real conversation. And I want to say it probably twice to you that you could be the best entrepreneur in the planet. Like right. that's a real, like it's not, right. it's not, I'm cocky. It's not a whatever, but if, but if that's how you feel, right. Mm-hmm. And there are stories. Like I got one, my buddy in Arizona, like this much debt in March, by the end of the year, he's going to be debt free and a hundred K in the bank. You can right. do whatever right. you want to do. You are holding yourself back. There's a, uh, I, I do Ironmans. I, I train from Ironmans, a lot of lonely training. And, and the, the joke is, is the, <laughs> it's the only, the only race is it's you versus you. Right. For real. And we're not standing here having a conversation, trying to puff our chest out. He's not putting the sneakers behind you. He's proud of the sneakers. He loves the sneakers. He's proud of the yep. real estate he's done. He's proud of where he is today. And he's saying that, but there's so much more. But what I love is that you're watching, man, I tell you what, people don't put enough stock in this. Doing it with your boys, like doing right. it around your friends. And like, yep. like we were talking with a bunch of big investors. We're talking about dudes that ha- make like 250 grand a month, right? Mm-hmm. And they're like, dude, it's just Monopoly. Like, it's just fun because we're doing it with our friends. We don't even feel right. like working. Dude, right. I have seven podcasts today, two coaching calls. I'll work out twice today. I have seven meetings tomorrow. I love what I do, man. Right. So right. I don't even care, dude. I'm like <laughs> all day. And if people ask me all the time, they're like, how do you get up for this? I'm like, how do I not? Like, right. life is so much fun. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, I, dude, I've been through this shit. <laughs> I've but, lived in the closet. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just grateful that I got a little. I'm only in 250 square feet right now. I'm just grateful I got that. Chilling, sure. you know. And and I, cool. I think I think that that we, you know, it's funny. I was listening when I was at the gym this morning. You know, we have such an issue with being right. Like we, everybody wants to be right instead of get it mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. And I think that we have stripped the humanity from from the growth process and what i mean by that is because everything's on camera and it's youtube Mm -hmm. and instagram and everything nobody's allowed to have a journey Mm -hmm. you know the lighting has to be perfect the sound has to be perfect you you know you can't nobody can fail you know like nobody can ever fail you can't have anger in this society i'm like no like i started here i'm here and every time i'm trying to get better right right and and my favorite thing and I want you to steal this too. My favorite thing is when 10 years when you're sitting on the beach somewhere and you're like chilling and the guy's going to go, oh, he's an overnight success. And you're going to be like, right, dude, I've, right. been, I've been cutting it since <laughs> six, baby. <laughs> you yep, know what's going to happen. Yep, you know what's going to yep, happen. Yep. And you put in the time, you were in the hospital, you were in the combine, you were in everything. So, you know, like I want you to stand up on your soapbox and I want you to sing and, and talk as much as you want. And I want mm-hmm. you to tell, cause I, a lot of my audience is younger. I coach a lot of kids, tell them just the tips, whatever you want to tell them on what they need to do for whether it be in, inspirational entrepreneurship, whatever you want to tell. Them. First off, um, I feel like I didn't mention my mom as much and that's a disservice for me not doing that. So I have to make sure that I have to shout out to my mom and my dad. I've uh, been together my entire life. 
and still together to this day, grew up in the same exact house and having that strong foundation alone, I wouldn't be anywhere I am today. I wouldn't have the mindset that I have today. And I'm completely 100% thankful and appreciative of them each and every day. That's why I made sure I bought my house next to theirs and I could access them whenever they need me. And I'm always available, like I was saying before, because again, no matter what, all the success, whatever, is about my family, it's about my future family. And that's the most important thing to me over any of this stuff ever, mm-hmm. like ever, ever, ever. So that's just first get that out the way. And then from there, no matter what, if anybody ever tries to think they have control of your life, they don't. The only time they do have control of your life is if you let them get inside your head and let you feel like, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this because they said I can't do it or they said I can't do that. No, you can do whatever you want to do. It may not get there as fast as you want it to. But if you keep stepping forward and trying to step forward, at least making an effort, have no regrets. Then that way, whenever you get older, you can't be like, oh, I wish I would have tried this. I wish I would have tried that. I wish I would have done this. No, I tried this. I learned that. Let me teach you what I learned. Do that. Do that. Do that. Keep trying. Keep just keep pushing forward and learn from every single thing, the success and the failures, because that's the only way you can teach your younger generation. And then you can teach your friends around you from all your experiences. Otherwise, you're just going to keep guessing. Man, I tell you what. I'm I'm so pumped we met. I, I can't wait to meet you in person. Uh, I don't wear sneakers. I wear cowboy boots. So uh, <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. But we'll, we'll, I still rock it either way. But, uh, dude, I've watched a bunch of your YouTubes. Uh, you're on Instagram. Tell everybody how they can find out about you. Check out your show. It's awesome, man. Um, DJ underscore sneakerhead is like my name on Instagram and Twitter or DNA underscore show. Is going to be uh, Instagram and Twitter. And they're all linked together. If you find one, you'll find everything. And then uh, YouTube is DNA Show. And then my name, Darren Willingham, is my second channel. I'm going to start posting more about real estate, finance, different stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Because again, like I said, I learned on YouTube. It's kind of hard to mix everything on one single channel. So it's smarter to grow separately on the two. Um, A lot of my effort goes towards the sneaker content right now because it's doing so well. But mm-hmm. I definitely want to start tapping into more of the real estate and finance stuff, showing my experiences, my remodel projects and, you know, what I learned about money and all the mistakes I've made so people don't make the same mistakes. So mm-hmm. hopefully I can help people uh, just learn from my mistakes, at least, because that's always a good thing to do. Like People say, like, oh, he's a bad example. Oh, he's like when they talk bad about somebody. And I'm like, why? Like, just appreciate that person for what they are and learn that that's not what you want to do. And then now you use that as a great example. If I do this, I'm going to end up like that. So I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do the opposite of what they're doing. Yeah. You know what high performance do? They, they see qualities or things in other people. They pull from it. They take a little bit what they need. They leave the rest and they move on. Yep. And we sometimes feel like, look, I, I only want to be around dudes and women that as we classify in our group, a whole life millionaire. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to be, I don't care if you make a million dollars a month. If you're a shithead and you're right. a piece of shit to your parents or your kids right. or your what, I don't care. I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm <laughs> yeah. looking for a lifestyle, you know, full circle. Like, you know what I'm saying? Cause I do what I say I'm going to do. I am who I am. And, and I don't care if I've got a million dollars or a thousand bucks. And that's what, right. I love about my financial advice. Like, I don't care if he manages like $2 billion. If you had a thousand bucks, he treats you the same. If you had $10 million mm-hmm. and those are the people mm-hmm. that I want to do business with. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's something I want to ask selfishly for me. Cause what is the craziest, uh, sneaker flip you've ever done or like the craziest deal you've ever done before you think? Um, so one time I sold a pair of shoes for almost $20,000 You know, straight cash. I had to do fly out. And uh, it was just a one-day deal. He flew out, picked them up from the airport, went, picked up the shoes, went to the bank, got the rest of the cash, took them back to the airport. He left. And then uh, two weeks later, he came back, and I found a bigger deal. And then we did something for like 54000 or something like that. Straight cash, same thing. And then we just like do these crazy shoe deals. Like it's it's wild. Because <laughs> – because, and I want to I wanna, – because I'm, I'm a psychology and, and, and mind buff, right? 
and it's what I do. I coach people all day and I met, you know, we're, we're in the mind. There's a psychology right behind revolving your business out of what somebody truly loves. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, it- and, well, I want to laugh about that because dude, you have not seen shit until you've trained with people that do Ironman training. Right. And they've got like, Twenty thousand dollar bikes, <laughs> and you're yeah, like, who real? buys a bike for twenty thousand? But they love it so much, and right on there glass. is. So if you have a, a skill or ability, or you can create a business around want, meaning they're gonna get it no matter what. It's the same thing with drug, you know, cigarettes and, and beer, like whatever. Mm-hmm. Like people are gonna get it no matter if it's twenty dollars, a hundred. So there is a psychology behind something that people resonate with so much, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And and I find it. I don't think people put enough stock in that when they're, when they're creating businesses, right? If you have a yeah. commodity, right? Which is real estate can be one, like people need a place to live. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's not a question of what the economy's doing and, and yeah, the price might fluctuate, but you're always going to have renters in what I tell everybody. This is the best advice I can give you. If you're a new real estate investor, find the shittiest home in the best school district neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And you will always have value in that property. You can never be the best on a block. Nope. If never. you're the best in the block, get out. If you're the smartest in the room, find a different room. Right. My man, right. I appreciate it, my dude. And uh, thank you so much. And guys, if you like this episode, make sure you share it with your friends and send it around. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on -on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.